do appear to have lost the Spanish foreign minister. We'll try and see if we can uh, get, back, uh, get her back on the line in, in just a moment or two. Uh, but from what the minister was suggesting there, uh, a, a degree of disbelief that an agreement can't be made on fishing, uh, it does rather sound like perhaps uh, there is a, a closeted criticism uh, of the EU negotiator's side. Uh, we will see if we can. Uh, we will see if we can get that. Late. Can we get back to the minister? No, we can't, I'm afraid. Uh, we'll see if we can get that later on in the show. So let's move on slightly. Uh, if it feels, <laughs> it certainly does for me, uh, like these Brexit arguments have been going on for years, that is because they have. Uh, almost four years ago, uh, the UK's ambassador to the EU, Sir Ivan Rogers, resigned, blasting ill-founded arguments and muddled thinking about Brexit in his resignation letter to colleagues. Sir Ivan, of course, worked in Brussels for many years, pleased to say, he joins us on the programme now. So, Ivan, very good morning to you. Um, I wonder if I'll start with you in the same way that I'm doing uh, with every one of our guests this morning. From your position, how likely is it that we're going to get a deal by the end of today? I wouldn't have thought it was very likely by the end of today, but uh, that's a very different question from whether we get it by the end of the year, I think. So I, I think it's odds against today, but I'm not, sure it'll, I'm not sure the talks will break down today either. I, uh, most of these deadlines in, in Brexit over, the many, over many years have carried on being broken, and uh, I suspect this might be the latest, but we'll see. Yeah, if I had a pound for every time I've said on here, it's a crunch week in terms of Brexit, I would have quite a exactly. lot of pounds. Um, but let's focus then on the state of the negotiations uh, as they stand. Speaking to the Spanish Foreign Minister there, the two key sticking points from the European Union side, fishing and level playing field. I mean, on both of those, do you see them as, as substantive points of divergence from the European Union's position, or are they playing a little bit of politics here? Oh, no, I think this is real and substantive. Uh, I think level playing field has always been the issue. And this goes right back, incidentally, to 2016, uh, when I was thinking about this before the referendum, let alone immediately afterwards. This was obviously going to be the sticking point and the potential breaking point. And I've been one of those saying for many years that uh, it was highly likely that we would end up with no deal. So this doesn't surprise me at all that the crunch comes over level playing field. On fisheries, look, it's enormously complex. Uh, extremely political on both sides, going right up to leaders' level, even though uh, the economic stakes, as the Spanish foreign minister has just been telling you, are may not be enormous. That doesn't that doesn't matter when it comes to uh, leaders' perceptions, both our own leaders and key leaders across the European Union. I've always thought it was in principle soluble because it's in both sides' interest to do a deal on fisheries. They need stable and continuous and reliable access to our territorial waters. We need access to be able to sell our processed fish into the European market without um, duties and quotas. So there's a deal to be done there, but it's mightily difficult to do it. It will require transition periods. It will require a bit of fudge about exactly what happens at the end. But I've never thought it would break down on fisheries. I do think it could break down over level playing field because that goes to the heart of what Brexit is for in the eyes of those who uh, promoted Brexit. Uh, the, the complaints are Ivan from from the British side as it as regards level playing field. It's not necessarily that you know there wouldn't be they wouldn't be allowed to diverge in future. More that the European Union would be able to unilaterally impose uh, your know, tariffs of, of of some form. I mean, isn't there a way out of this in some independent arbitration process, some joint arbitration process, uh, UK EU? I mean, those options, whilst they're discussed in the papers, don't seem to be getting much traction in Brussels. Well, by definition, we don't know exactly what will get traction in the in the talks in Brussels, and I'd be surprised if there weren't all manner of propositions on the table. Why else are they carrying on talking? Um, the problem here is there's a philosophical divide and an ideological divide, and it's not just practical arrangements. Could could technocrats on both sides devise a set of arrangements with which they might well be happy and believe that they could manage this process? Because what we're talking about here, why is this so difficult? And I said all, all along it was so difficult, rather than the easiest trade deal in history, one of the most difficult, because we're diverging. Um, and trade deals are mostly between, nearly always between, partners who are seeking to get closer together and remove and reduce and eliminate trade barriers between jurisdictions. In this case, we're obviously raising trade barriers between jurisdictions because we're seeking to get further away. That must be the purpose of Brexit. Why are you doing Brexit unless you want to diverge in material respects from the, the law book that you're leaving when you leave the European Union? But the management of that process is inevitably difficult. Obviously, from the UK angle, uh, ministers will think, well, we're free and we're sovereign and we're autonomous and we can go our own way. 
and they want that to be a world without consequences on the European market. The European side is inevitably saying, well, hang on, we're not going to give you any assurances that there won't be consequences on the European market. It depends what you do with your divergence, uh, how far you diverge, and how deliberately you try and undercut our market, as they see it. So this was always going to be extremely sort of toxic and difficult debate to get through. Could you find technical solutions and arbitration processes and dispute resolution mechanisms that work? In my view, yes, you could. But the question for all of us is, if you could, why have they not already done so? If this was simply a technical and administrative question, they would have solved it by now. And it isn't just that. It's a philosophical question about where are we going and to what extent are there any constraints on our room for manoeuvre after we've gone? Given all of that, and given your description of the difficulties and the, and the toxicity, in fact, of, the, of these negotiations at, at, at points, Boris Johnson, of course, went to Brussels this week for that dinner with Ursula von der Leyen. I'm wondering, should the Prime Minister have inserted himself in this process a little bit sooner than, than this last week, you know, given the fact that, from what you're saying, it's, it's, it's an injection of political will that appears to be required most of all? Well, it's, it's obviously been an extraordinarily difficult few months, so it's very difficult to comment from the outside when you're outside the system. And we've had COVID-19, which is an enormous economic and public health crisis uh, running at the same time. And it's not been possible to hop on a plane uh, and get over. So there are lots of sort of uh, mitigating circumstances here. Um, yes, I do think this required an injection of political will and political momentum earlier on if we were not to reach the crunch point. I've always thought that Christmas 2020 would be the biggest crisis of Brexit, and here we are. So it's not a great surprise. But it does require political will, political guidance. The negotiators can sit in a room for weeks on end and pretty much have in the last few weeks. But unless they've got new elements to their mandate, the European Union won't change its mandate. I imagine the Prime Minister isn't changing David Frost's mandate. But you have to know what room for manoeuvre you have within that mandate to explore options at this stage. Otherwise, they're just going to go around in ever-decreasing circles. How does the European Union view our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson? How is he characterised uh, by those in positions of power there? Well, I think it's very difficult to generalise. I mean, people deal with who they deal with. They know that he was um, a, a key player, if not the key player, in, in getting Brexit through. Uh, they know that brought down um, not only uh, David Cameron after the referendum, but uh, Theresa May in 2019, because her version of Brexit was unsaleable to the party and unsaleable to the people led by Boris Johnson. So they're well aware of the history. Sometimes I think the UK side can be a little bit naive in not understanding that for many of the Europeans involved in this process, they've been through this many times before with many different UK prime ministers, and they tend to have more longevity and experience on dealing with this than many on the UK side who are maybe going through this for the, for the first time. I think this week, to be very candid, I think they felt that there was some degree of naivety, if not worse, on the British side to believe that somehow... If you could just get to leaders and to uh, Frau Merkel and Monsieur Macron, and they could break through in some way, they'd be in a different position from Michel Barnier, and they would sort it out at leader level. That's simply not when you're a third country and you're outside the European Union. That's not the way the European Union is ever going to negotiate with a third country leader, whether it's Boris Johnson or anybody else. So this sense that the UK sometimes has that it's being uniquely victimised. You know, I've sat dealing with third countries and non-European players in the European Union for uh, representing the UK for a very long time. This is how the EU deals on trade issues with any third country partner. And you don't get to see individual leaders to try and divide and rule the European Union. That's never going to work. So I think Wednesday didn't go very well. It doesn't surprise me it didn't go very well. All the signs were bad before the dinner. And there were very clear messages in what Frau Merkel said to the Bundestag on Wednesday morning, that there were going to be difficulties over non-regression and evolution clauses. And indeed, there are. Sir Ivan Rogers, lovely to see you this morning and a very Merry Christmas to you and yours when it comes. Thank you very much and to you.